was online music. So we have to fit in with that. Well, I'm allowed to say welcome to you all now. <laughs> welcome here and welcome as well on carlislechristianscience.org.uk and spirituality4.me. Welcome. And we're really happy to welcome Philip Hockley here today. Philip is a full-time Christian science practitioner, which means he is full-time with, um, with Christian science healing right the way through, and a member of the Christian Science Board of Lectureship, which means that he travels all over the place, or he's on Zoom all over the place, and um, he talks about Christian science. Today, Philip is talking about a new view of God and its effect on well-being. We're looking forward to listening to you, Philip. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. That was a, a lovely, heartfelt welcome. And I must say, if you've never been to Cumbria in spring, you're missing something very special. There's a river here called the River Eden, I noticed. And it's like being in the garden here. The flowers are fragrant. The trees are in full bloom. It's just beautiful. And as was mentioned in the introduction, we're welcoming people who are live streaming today and watching presently. This will also be a recorded version of this event, which will be available for those to watch at a later date. But the important thing is that the facts that we're going to be discussing, they don't change. Um, there's no sell-by date to these ideas, because the ideas are all based on laws of God, which I discovered for myself when I first came to a Christian science lecture, just like this, about 20 years ago. And when I came to that lecture, I was not conscious of the presence of any of these laws to be able to help me in my situation because I was registered as permanently physically handicapped at that time. And what I discovered at the time of that lecture didn't just transform my own well-being, but in the years since, I've learned that I can pray this way about the well-being of our communities about the well-being of the world and even the well-being of those people affected by the atrocities happening in Eastern Europe right now. So those are some of the ideas that I'll be sharing with you today. But I'll start at the beginning. I did come to a lecture just like this as a registered disabled person. And what I do is I would normally bring this certificate with me for people to examine for themselves to see that this was not just my opinion, this is the medical opinion of all the medical experts that have been on my case for many years. Now, I know that the word disability can mean different things to different people. So I'll just share with you the particular disabilities that I was struggling with at the time. And they'd started in early childhood. I'd had an episode of arthritis. This left me with one leg shorter than the other. That leg length discrepancy then caused my spine to twist in the opposite direction. And because my spine was twisted, my neck was also off center. And to keep my eyes level, my neck was always leaning. And what would happen is my neck would sometimes dislocate and lock very painfully for weeks at a time. So at the time of that lecture 20 years ago, I had a neck brace on to support my head. Now that was the structural condition that I was struggling with at the time. But by far the most serious problem at that time in the opinion of the doctors, was my weight loss issues because I'd had unresolved food problems for almost a decade where I was unable to absorb normal food ingredients because of multiple food allergies. What this meant was my usual body weight, which is about, in British, I've got to remember now because I've been speaking to American audiences, in British stones, I'm usually about 12 and a half stone. I was seven stone on the night. If you want it in pounds like the Americans would, it was 185 pounds. My usual weight was down to 105. Or if you're viewing from a European country, that's purely metric. Or if you're a youngster who's been brought up with the metric system here, it was from 80 kilos to 45 kilos. But in any currency that you want to use it. It was a significant challenge to my health. 
And the doctors basically said, if I didn't get this resolved, I was likely to die probably later on that year because I couldn't continue to keep losing weight. So when the doctors said there was no more that they could do for me, I didn't take that lying down. I actually rose in rebellion and I thought, well, I'll go out and I'll find a healing from one of the multitude of alternative therapies that were emerging at the time. And I went from A to Z, from acupuncture all the way through to zone therapy and everything in between, and still I wasn't helped. Then in sheer desperation, I even reached out to the local Christian churches in my area. Now, I do say sheer desperation on purpose, because up until that point in my life, I had been an atheist based on some very painful experiences I'd had as a child with people in my village who called themselves Christians. And so ever since that time, if somebody told me they were a Christian, my natural reaction would be to just recoil. And so here I was facing what looked like an early grave. I thought I'd give them a go. I contacted all the churches. They all offered to pray for me. Still, I wasn't helped. So now it looks like I've got no human avenue to explore. I'm done. I have to prepare for an early grave. And a friend of mine mentioned a mindfulness technique which was designed to help people to learn to die at peace. And with this technique, you basically are aware of all of the breaking down of the body and the pain and the discomfort that might cause, but mentally you find a sense of peace with it. And I was practicing it, and I must admit, I felt a sense of peace, even though the body was still breaking itself down. And this was the condition I was on the night that I came to the lecture. And when I came to the event, I came with short, painful, breathless footsteps. I was bowed over. I came to the front row. I sat down. And I'm just using that mindfulness technique to try not to react to all the pain and the inflammation from the short walk to the venue. When everybody started clapping, the lecturer walked out on stage. And within moments of her opening her mouth, my heart sank because she said that that's, that night's event we're going to be based on God's great love for all mankind as found in the Bible. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, they're Christians. Oh, now I didn't want to be there. I wished I hadn't made the painful effort to get to the venue. And then she went and started reading from the Bible. And things did not get any better. She read from the first book of the Bible, Genesis. This is what she read. God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Really, I was thinking to myself, God sees all of this, this painful, diseased body, which has now been written off by the doctors, has been incurable. I was in my mid-30s, and I'm not likely to make it into my 40s. And this lady is reading to me that God sees all of this that he's made and says it's all very good. Well, this just started to confirm for me my previous opinions of Christians as being completely out of touch with reality. So now I've got no interest in anything this lady might have to say. In fact, I'm just waiting to plan my exit strategy as soon as all the inflammation and the pain has gone from the walk to the venue. And I'm not interested in listening to anything she has to say until a few moments later when something grabbed my attention again. And again, it wasn't in a good way. And this time, the ideas came from this book. It's called Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, written by an American lady, Mary Baker Eddy. Now, if you've never heard of this book before, it's not a problem because on the night of that lecture, I hadn't heard of it either. However, the ideas contained within this book had a life-changing effect on me. And if you'll just bear with me, I'll share with you those ideas that I found so controversial when I first heard them. God is at once the center and circumference of being. God is at once the center and circumference of being, I thought to myself. Remember, I'd been passing my awareness through what at the time I understood to be my center and circumference. 
So there's my center, here's my circumference, yes? And I was passing my awareness through it, and the doctors agreed. I was full of disease and disability and discomfort. This lady wants me to accept that God is the center and circumference of all of this suffering. Or oh, now I became enraged. My human thoughts were full of anger and ill will and judgment. I couldn't contain them. I was really upset by what I was hearing. And in that agitated state, something else grabbed my attention. But this time, it was in a really good way. And it unfolded a bit like this. Sitting there, full of anger and ill will, I really don't want to be in this venue now. I'm trying to get myself ready to leave as soon as the swelling goes down and leave in a huff so they know how displeased I am. When something started to grab my attention, in the, the only way I could describe it was like the opening up of a roof on a building. I'll share it with you like this. Today, we have four walls and a ceiling. So the space within this room is a defined space. But just imagine then if somebody were to come and just lift the roof off. The difference between that amount of space above the building compared to the amount of space just within this room would be quite remarkable, wouldn't it? It would be a huge difference. Well, just imagine then that my human thinking, which seemed to be so full of anger and ill will, it seemed like something was opening up above into a larger sense of consciousness than I had ever experienced before in my life. And as I was exploring this new sense of consciousness, I started to notice two things. First of all, I noticed it was incredibly peaceful. And secondly, I noticed an increasing sense of feeling love. Now, this love that I was feeling, it wasn't like the love that had been freely exchanged with me by loving family and friends and girlfriends. It wasn't that kind of a love. This love felt like it was pressing in on every square inch of my body. When I was asked to describe it a couple of days later, I used the phrase or the, or the term oceanic because it reminded me of what had happened when I'd learned to scuba dive as a younger man. When I'd learned to scuba dive, the deeper you go down in the water, the more you feel the water pressure on every square inch of your body. And that's how that love felt. It felt like that love was pressing in on every square inch of my body. While I was in this incredible new condition, the thought came to me, don't forget to pass your awareness through the body without reacting. So I did. I went back to that mindfulness. I started passing my awareness through the body. And to my amazement, I noticed the next remarkable thing. All the pain, the stiffness, the inflammation that I'd brought with me to the lecture, it was starting to soften and loosen. And eventually, it just evaporated right before my very eyes while I was sitting there. Again, when asked to describe it by some of the church members a couple of days later, I told them that it felt like a, the way that an ice cube would operate from the brand new ice cube in a freezer compartment with sharp edges and angles, if you were to place it on a warm, sunny windowsill, all those sharp edges would soften first, then it would become a puddle, and then eventually the whole thing would evaporate. That was exactly how it felt with all the stiffness and the pain and the angles of all the joints. It felt like they were softening, loosening, and eventually it all evaporated, and I found myself in a completely sensationless body for the first time in my life. And the next thing I knew, everybody started clapping to mark the end of the hour. And I hadn't listened to a blessed word that she'd said. I was so absorbed with what was going on internally, I'd lost all sense of where I was. And so when I went to get up, I was really confused. And I tried to make a beeline for the exit as quickly as I could without making eye contact because I didn't want to start a conversation in case I said something daft. And on the way out, just like today, they were giving away copies of this book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. Now, I picked up a copy of the book that day. If you're watching this live online, there will be contact details at the end of this lecture where you can get a copy of the book for you as well. I was able to pick up a copy that day and take it home. Now, I had no idea what that book contained. But in the days and weeks after the lecture, that book, Science and Health, alongside the Bible, 
they became an absolute rock explaining to me in bite-sized chunks exactly what had gone on during that lecture. But first of all, I had to get home. And remember, an hour earlier I'd come to the venue as a disabled person in excruciating pain. I'm now leaving the venue an hour later and I'm taking tall. I'm standing tall. I'm taking long, effortless, pain-free strides. I'm breathing deeply. And I'm so confused, I literally mumbled under my breath. What on earth just happened back there? And to my amazement, as clear as a bell in my own thinking, I heard these words. Philip, it was just like when you stopped believing in monsters under the bed. And I thought to myself, wow, that's really strange. Because at the time of the lecture, I was in my mid-30s. I hadn't believed in monsters under the bed since I was in my mid-20s. Uh, uh, no, sorry, since I was about five. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was a late developer, but not that late, <laughs> since I was about five. So this is about 30 years earlier, I'd gone through this experience of these monsters under the bed. And if there's any youngsters watching, spoiler alert, there never were any monsters under that bed. But I didn't know that, okay? So I struggled with them. And it happened like this. I would wake up at night needing to use the bathroom, too afraid to put my feet on the floor in case that monster grabbed me, I'd end up sitting there and wetting myself. Now, this went on night after night, week after week, until eventually I had a pretty bad case of nappy rash. It started showing below my school shorts. So during the day in school, the boys were picking on me and calling me a big baby. My teachers weren't happy with me because I was tired and listless in school because I wasn't sleeping very well. So the daytimes were not pleasant. The nighttimes? Oh, they were pure terror. Every time I woke up in that darkened room, I felt this crushing grip of fear until one eventful night. I remember I woke up desperately needing to go to the bathroom, too afraid to place my feet on the floor in case that monster grabbed me. And I'm just about to accept, oh, here we go again. When as clear as a bell in my own thinking, I heard these words, Philip, why don't you just look under the bed? Those words seemed so compelling and so compassionate. I didn't hesitate. I looked under the bed and what do you think I saw? No monster. That crushing grip of fear that had held me for those couple of months, it felt like it was released instantly. You know the way that a dish sponge would operate when you squeeze a dish sponge, it's all out of shape. And, and fellas, if any of you don't know what a dish sponge looks like, just ask your wives, okay? If you squeeze a dish sponge and it's all out of shape, you release the dish sponge and its nature is to pop back into shape, isn't it? That's what a dish sponge does. It felt like that crushing grip had been released on this little terrified boy and I just felt like I popped back into shape, meaning the happy little chappy that I'd been all along. I stepped down off the bed, I toddled off to the bathroom and I came back, I slept soundly from that night on. Now, fast forward 30 years. I'm just leaving my first ever contact with Christian Science at a Christian Science lecture. I'd entered the venue as a disabled person. I'm leaving the venue an hour later completely free from those disabilities, and I haven't got a clue what's happened to me. I ask out loud, what on earth just happened back there? The answer that I got was, it's just like when you stopped believing in monsters under the bed. As strange as that sounded to me when I first heard it, as I continued the journey home that night, the similarities started to dawn on me. Because just like that little boy who had that crushing burden of that fear of the monster that didn't really exist, this otherwise healthy middle-aged sportsman had these crushing burdens laid on his head. I was told, first of all, I was permanently physically handicapped. And then lately they were starting to say, if you don't start absorbing food, you're going to die really soon. These had become a crushing burden on me. But something happened on the night of that lecture that released that crushing grip. And I popped back into shape. Quite literally, not just were my legs the same length and my spine straight. My neck was free from that day to this. But the very next morning, I was able to start eating and absorbing normal food ingredients for the first time in over seven years. In fact, I regained those lost five stones 
in four weeks of the lecture. That's a lost 80 pounds or a lost 35 kilos within four weeks of that lecture. I just popped back into shape. But remember, before this event, I'd been a convinced atheist all my life. And how can something like a Christian science lecture have any effect on somebody that has no faith in it at all? I was really puzzled. So the very next day, I was able to make my way over to what's called the Christian Science Reading Room. Now, Christian Science churches and Christian Science societies all over the world, they maintain what's called a Christian Science Reading Room, and it's basically a public access library where you can come in at various times of the week, you can read the scriptures, or you can study the teachings and writings about Christian science. I made my way over to that reading room, and if you're looking for a reading room anywhere near you, again, after the lecture, there'll be contact details. We'll be able to connect you with a local church or a local reading room. I made my way over to the local reading room there. The first question I had was, who was that lady mentioned in the lecture last night? Because I'd been looking for healing for almost a decade. I'd never heard of Christian science. And I'd never heard of Mary Baker Eddy, who was named as the discoverer of Christian science. So they gave me a biography all about Mrs. Eddy's life. I started reading. I started noticing a couple of themes that were appearing in her life. She was born in the early 1800s in America, in the New England area, into a deeply religious family, and this love of religion stayed with her throughout her young life. Then I noticed she also had long periods of ill health. She was a quite, quite a sickly child. She lost periods of schooling, she missed normal family activities sometimes, so she struggled with poor health most of her young life. Then when she becomes a young adult, she experiences the joy of marriage, and as her husband and her are expecting their first child, the husband tragically dies, leaving her widowed. When I was reading this part of Mrs. Eddy's life, I felt this strange sense of compassion for this lady that I've never met because some of the challenges she was facing were challenges my own grandmother had faced. And when she became a widow, it actually reminded me of a challenge my own mother had faced. And so I'm feeling this strange sense of compassion for this lady when I get to the next chapter in her life, which took a terrible turn for the worse. Mrs. Eddy had a fall on an icy pavement in the winter of 1866. She so badly injured herself that everybody in attendance including a local medical doctor, were convinced she would not recover from these injuries. Mrs. Eddy is probably in the deepest, darkest period of a life that had been littered with struggles. Mrs. Eddy asks for a copy of her beloved Bible. She was seeking some crumbs of comfort from her love of the Bible and the teachings of Jesus Christ and his healing ministry, she said she opened the Bible at random and they fell open, the pages fell open to a healing account of a man that was disabled, came in contact with Christ Jesus and was healed immediately. Mrs. Eddy said she knew that healing account because she'd read that in her earlier Bible studies a number of times. So it was a very familiar story to her. So there was nothing new in that. But what was new about this situation is that Mrs. Eddy was probably yearning more than ever from her love of the Bible to find some comfort in it. And she said in that deeply yearning state, she started to experience the presence of love filling the room. Now, Mrs. Eddy was alone at the time, so she reasoned quickly that this love didn't have a human source. And as she was starting to experience more and more of this sense of love, she said she suddenly rose up well, thinking to herself that maybe this love was divine love, the love of God, as described in the Bible. God is described as love in the book of John. She said she was so enveloped in it, she suddenly rose up well, dressed herself. Then she went into the next room and said two things. She said, I am well, and I now know how to make other people well. She then spent the next few years of her life deeply searching the scriptures to see if there were any explanations or laws or promises that could back up and explain this remarkable event that she'd had. At the end of those few years of deeply searching the scriptures, 
she'd come up with the first edition of this book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. Now, she calls it a key to the Scriptures on purpose. This is because Mrs. Eddy didn't invent any of this stuff. Mrs. Eddy didn't make this stuff up. She found all of the stuff that she was writing about had its origins in the Bible. These were Bible-based promises and Bible-based laws. And I'll just share with you a couple of them, just a, a, a sprinkling to give you an idea. In Hebrews, it says this, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. So that's God saying he's going to write, God's laws are going to appear in our hearts and our minds. Mrs. Eddy, in her own words, she said this, I learned these truths in divine science, that all real being is in God, the divine mind, and that life, truth, and love are all powerful and ever-present, that the opposite of truth called error, sin, sickness, disease, death, is the false testimony of false material sense. Now, these material senses that Mrs. Eddy is describing as false, they're the same five material senses I'm using readily today, you know, hearing, sight, taste, touch, the, the regular five material senses. Mrs. Eddy is calling them false material senses, then she introduces a concept called spiritual sense, and this is what she says about it. Spiritual sense is a constant, sorry, I'll say that again, spiritual sense is a conscious, constant capacity to understand God. A conscious, constant capacity to understand God. Now, when I first read this quote, this came from what's called the Christian Science Quarterly Bible Lesson. It's basically a weekly Bible study that all Christian scientists take up around the world. You learn a couple of little bite-sized chunks about the nature of God from the Bible first, and then a couple of bite-sized chunks about how to apply that in your daily life in practical ways. And remember, I was a newcomer to the Bible, I hadn't studied it before, so taking these weekly Bible lessons was fascinating for me because I'd learn a little bit about the nature and quality of God. Then, from science and health, I'd learn how to apply that practically in my daily life. And when I first read those two statements, that, first of all, God is writing his laws into our hearts and our minds, and this spiritual sense is a conscious, constant capacity to understand God, it reminded me of the way that my physics teacher had explained something else that I'd been living with but never conscious of, and that was radio waves. My physics teacher said that, you know, the whole time you've been in this room, radio waves have been passing through every brick and beam of this building completely undetected by your five material senses until he did this. So what this is doing now, this is proving to me that even though my five material senses were not aware of those broadcasts, those radio waves were actually here, weren't they? It just means then that my five material senses were not conscious of it. It doesn't mean the thing was absent, does it? It just means I wasn't conscious of it with my five material senses. My physics teacher demonstrated another lesson, which I've remembered to this day, very helpful. They buried the antenna completely in their fist and did this. What this is now proving to me then is that these radio waves, they're actually even passing through every fiber of my body undetected by my five material senses. And what I learned from that was just because my five material senses are not conscious of something, it doesn't mean that that thing is absent, does it? It just means my five material senses are not conscious of it. What Mrs. Eddy started to feel she was discovering was that this spiritual sense, which is above the five material senses, may be the way that she could understand a tremendous mystery that she'd been studying about all her life in the Bible, this mystery of how the Christ appears in people's lives. 
And Mrs. Eddy had studied the Bible all her life and never fully understood it. But now she was starting to think that maybe this was how you can experience it. And this was what she wrote about it. Again, she starts with Bible-based promises. This is the quote in Colossians, which says, God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. She also relied on another passage, which came from Philippians, which says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. So that, that was Mrs. Eddy's Bible instruction on the availability of the Christ. Mrs. Eddy then wrote about some of the healing experiences she was able to have with other people soon after she herself was healed. And she talks about the way that the Christ appears in broadly in two ways. She talks about how it appears at the time of a physical healing, but she also talks about how it appears in daily life in our thinking. This is how she describes it at the time of a physical healing. In part, Christ, the divine manifestation of God, which comes to the flesh to destroy incarnate error. Then, in our thinking, Mrs. Eddy says this. Christ is the true idea voice in good, the divine message from God to men speaking to the human consciousness. How does that Christ speak to our human consciousness, I wondered, as a new student of the Bible? Is it possibly because God has written those laws into our hearts and our minds, that we were made in God's image and likeness as in first Genesis? Is it because we have this spiritual sense, this sense which is above the five material senses, that spiritual sense which can tune in maybe? to something the five material senses is not conscious of, that true idea voicing good, the divine message from God to men, speaking to our human consciousness. This became a fascinating introduction to me of the validity and the practical nature of the Bible in the modern age, so-called. I thought the Bible was just mumbo-jumbo, blind faith and myths from you know, olden times. Now, with Mrs. Eddy's key to the scriptures, I was starting to unlock some of those obscure Bible passages when I first read them. They were now becoming practical footsteps to how I could learn to experience this Christ for myself. Mrs. Eddy describes this in the way that we pray in Christian science. Christian science prayer is unlike any other form of prayer I'd ever been introduced to. And she dedicates the first chapter of her book to prayer. Prayer in Christian science is basically just quietening the five material senses or just ignore them if they won't be quiet and tune in, if you like, with your spiritual sense and see if you can hear what the divine message from God to men is, speaking to your human consciousness. Now, as I'm practicing this and learning this every week, every week's Bible lesson is a new subject related to the nature and quality of God and then the practical ideas of how to apply it from science and health. I'm really enjoying it, but there were a couple of big roadblocks. One of them was this. I kept running into this concept that God made us in his image and likeness. And Mrs. Eddy talks about man and women and children as being able to reflect these qualities of God. Now, I found this idea of reflection and image and likeness really puzzling because at the time, my only understanding of how a reflection works is simply the way that a mirror operates. And if I were to stand today, if you imagine there was a mirror across the room here, if I turned and faced the mirror and I'm wearing a long sleeve checked shirt, my image and likeness on that mirror would have to reflect back the same long sleeve checked shirt, wouldn't it? There couldn't be any difference between what the original is wearing and what the reflection is reflecting back. So for instance, if I turned and faced the mirror today wearing this, could my image and likeness be wearing a bright red puffer jacket? No, because I'm wearing the long sleeve checked shirt, the image and likeness would have to reflect back the same long sleeve checked shirt. So what I found so puzzling about this was, I've got three brothers that are all different shapes and sizes to me. 
if we were all made in God's image and likeness, as in first Genesis, which one of us does God look like? Is it the tall guy or the small guy? Didn't make any sense. And so I was struggling with this concept. One particular morning, it came up in the Bible lesson again. God made man in his image and likeness. And Mrs. Eddy refers to man being the reflection of God. And I'm thinking, I'll never get to the bottom of this. When I heard these words grab my attention, again, in my own thinking, just said, Philip, you're standing in the wrong place. You need to back up onto the mirror. You're my image and likeness. And so I pictured this for myself. And I pictured, instead of me creating an image and likeness, I now pictured myself as being back up onto the mirror, and I am the image and likeness of what? Of God. And just in my first few weeks of Bible studies, I'd already learned that God is the spirit of life and truth and love, all these lovely qualities. And as I was thinking about what God is, it was starting to dawn on me that the image and likeness here must reflect only those qualities. And I couldn't imagine God as having arthritis all those years earlier. In fact, I couldn't imagine God having one leg shorter than the other. And because I couldn't imagine God as having those diseases, it dawned on me how it couldn't really appear in the image and likeness. And it started to explain for me how healing happens in Christian science. When we start exchanging our human view based on the limited five material senses for a more spiritual view, that spiritual sense, which shows us more about our true nature as given in first Genesis. God made every man, woman, and child in creation in God's image and likeness. Now, if I wanted to know about who I was, I'd better start learning a bit more about what or who God is, I thought because that's the image and likeness that I am. And as I was thinking about this deeply, it dawned on me that those neighbors from my village who'd been so cruel to us kids, I'd carried ill will for probably 30 years towards those neighbors. Now, when I was thinking about all men, women, and children being made in God's image and likeness, if God was not a bully, my neighbors, as God's reflection, they couldn't have been a bully either. I was able to forgive all those resentful and hard feelings that I'd had for those neighbors that I'd been harboring for decades. It just fell away. And then it started to help me to pray about other significant challenges. In fact, some of you may remember there was a pandemic in 2009 called the swine flu pandemic. At that time, I was working in the Los Angeles County prison system, taking in the Christian Science Weekly Bible lesson. So we get a phone call this one particular week saying you don't have to come in this weekend. The prison's on a quarantined lockdown because swine flu has appeared in the prison population. Now, the other prison chaplain and myself, we were both Christian scientists. We would both learned to pray with our spiritual sense, to tune in, if you like, to the true idea of voicing good. We thought that if God didn't have swine flu, it couldn't appear in the image and likeness man, meaning every man and woman involved in the prison. So we confidently said we'll still come into the prison that night. We went in, we gave the weekly Bible lesson to the inmates, and while we were there, we probably had about three times as many people as usual because all the other volunteer services had stayed away for fear of that disease. Not only did we not see any signs nor symptoms of that disease while we were in the prison, or when we left in any of the prison offices, but we didn't see any signs nor symptoms in ourselves either in the days and weeks after that prison visit. Now, this wasn't based on good luck or wishful thinking. We had prepared ourselves by praying with another Bible-based promise. And this is the one that comes from the 91st Psalm. I was using it at the time and I still love it. I'll just read a little excerpt from it for you. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee 
to keep thee in all thy ways. That's not wishful thinking, is it? That's a Bible-based promise. And I was realizing with each new week of Bible studies that I was learning a little bit more about the nature of God and then a little bit more from science and health on how to apply that in my daily life. I found that I could practice this kind of prayer on all kinds of situations, not just in that swine flu pandemic in 2009, not just in the recent pandemic that we've all gone through that I don't need to remind anybody about, the political turmoil that was going on in America while I was traveling around America, the riots and the fire bombings, and then the problems I was hearing about from my family in Britain about Brexit. Then we've got this horrendous news coming out of Ukraine right now. All of these things, I was able to start praying in a simple way, thinking, if God made every single one of us in creation, in God's image and likeness, there can't be any enmity. It doesn't matter what political persuasion you may think you come from. Are you from the blue side of the house or the red side of the house? It doesn't matter which side of a, a war even that we find ourselves on. Every person involved is made in God's image and likeness. We have to experience at some point this kind of brotherly and sisterly love because we're all from the same source. And this has been helping me tremendously to deal with what looks like human division, human ill will, and human competition, because everybody is made in God's image and likeness. So that was really helpful as a new student of the Bible. And I'm increasing my understanding with every week of studying and every week of attending church, because when I go to the churches, you get a Sunday service every Sunday with a Sunday school for the children at the same time. But there's a Wednesday night testimony meeting, which is unique to Christian science churches and societies. Those Wednesday testimony meetings, you'll hear members of the congregation will stand up and they will just share honestly with you trials and tribulations, sometimes sudden accidents or, you know, heredity disease, whatever it might be. They'll share their problem. They'll tell you how they learn to pray this way in Christian science. And the result is often healing. In fact, the last 100 pages of this book is a chapter called Fruitage. Every single page is a written account by people, just like you and me, who came in contact with all kinds of problems in life, some trifling little things and some life-threatening things. All of them had learned to pray this way in Christian science. The result was healing. There's two magazines published currently by the church. We have a weekly Christian Science Sentinel and a monthly Christian Science Journal. They've been published for over 120 years, and every single edition contains a few pages. Again, testimonies written in by people just like you and I, who came across all kinds of challenges in their lives. They'd learned to pray this way in Christian science, and the result was healing. Now, you'd think with all of this evidence, with all of this incredible information that I'm seeing and learning about, and the proof in my own life of healing, you'd think I would be pretty convinced now, and yet there was still something lurking in the background, this doubt that I really didn't think I'd ever get to understand. And that was what had happened to all those symptoms that I'd brought with me to the lecture, those symptoms that had been so well tested and fought against by all the doctors on my case, what had happened to all those symptoms in the twinkling of an eye at the time of the lecture? It, just didn't make any sense to me. Where do you think I found the answer? It came from another week's Bible lesson. And again, it started with a Bible-based promise. This is a quote where Jesus is quoted as saying, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, the truth that Jesus is referring to there, of course, it's not just a mundane truth like two plus two equals four although that's very helpful. It's more to do with the spiritual truth of our spiritual identity as given in first Genesis. So Jesus is basically saying, you'll know the truth about your true nature, and this truth will set you free. Mrs. Eddy, in her own words, in that week's lesson, she said this, consciousness constructs a better body when faith in matter has been conquered. 
correct material belief by spiritual understanding and spirit will form you anew. Let me just back up there for a moment, if you don't mind. Mrs. Eddy says, correct material belief. Now, I'm going to use this just as a symbol for what a material belief can look like because all of these medical opinions, they're not based on spiritual facts or laws. They're just a medical opinion, yes, or a, a belief. Mrs. Eddy says, correct material belief by spiritual understanding, which I'm going to symbolize as this radio, because this radio shows me that there's something above my five material senses. This radio can tune into a message from the classic FM, I think it is. I can't tune into that with my five material senses. So this radio is proving to me that there is something that I can be conscious of. And this symbolizes for me spiritual sense, which allows me to become conscious of the true idea, voicing good, the divine message from God to men, speaking to our human consciousness. So she says, correct material belief by spiritual understanding and spirit will form you anew. Just like the dish sponge. We can just pop back into shape. And what is that shape so-called? Well, isn't it the first account in Genesis which says that God made all of us in his image and likeness, every man, woman, and child in creation made in God's image and likeness? And therefore, if we understand the nature and qualities of God, we're understanding the nature and quality of God's reflection by default. Because this is an unbroken law, isn't it, reflection? You can't change a reflection. If I stood here and I wave at a mirror and I'm smiling, my image and likeness can't choose to be grumpy and say I'm not taking part in this. The image and likeness has to smile and wave back. It's an unbroken law. It can't change. You know, we've seen this every day that we look into a mirror for ourselves. Mrs. Eddy didn't just answer my query with that statement, but this next statement, she asks a question which blew all of my doubts completely out of the water. Mrs. Eddy says this, if sickness is real, it belongs to immortality. If true, it is a part of truth. Would you attempt, with drugs or without, to destroy a quality or condition of truth? And Mrs. Eddy is using the word drugs, meaning medicines, yes? So Mrs. Eddy is saying, if sickness is real, it's a part of truth, can you change the truth of medicine? And I literally pictured myself trying to pour medicine on 2 plus 2 to stop it making 4, right? 2 plus 2 makes 4 today, doesn't it? Yes? Now, if it's true today, that means... Uh, thousand years ago, I can trust that two plus two was making four. And in another thousand years time, it'll still be making four because a truth for me never changes. That's what a truth is. It's constant, right? So Mrs. Eddy is saying, if sickness is real, it's a part of truth. Can you change the truth of medicine? So I pictured myself pouring medicine over the principle of mathematics to change it from four. You can't change it. What about if I surgically operated on two plus two? No, it's still going to make four. What if I give it counseling and said, we don't mind if you want to be a three today or a five tomorrow. No, makes no difference. Two plus two is a fixed fact. It's four. So Mrs. Eddy is saying, if sickness is real, part of truth, can you change it with medicines? I concluded for myself, no. She then goes on to say, but if sickness and sin are illusions, the awakening from this mortal dream or illusion. Remember the boy with the terrified boy with the monster under the bed who woke up from that illusion of the monster under the bed? She says, the awakening from this mortal dream or illusion will bring us into health, holiness, and immortality. This is the salvation which comes through God. The divine principle, love, as demonstrated by Jesus, or as I like to think, as reflected by Jesus. Jesus was so expert at reflecting that divine love into every situation he was called, that they even called him Jesus the Christ. He understood his source of love to be infinite. 
he could never run out of it. As long as he remained conscious of this constant capacity to understand God, Jesus was able to exude that love. That same love that flooded Mrs. Eddy's consciousness on that fateful night in 1866, in that most dreadful situation, that life-threatening fall that she'd had, Mrs. Eddy's consciousness was flooded with a new view of the presence and the power of God's love, and it completely transformed her well-being. Mrs. Eddy had studied the Bible all her life, and yet she'd never experienced such a remarkable and transformational effect in her life. This love, she was starting to learn that she could replicate the same healings that Jesus taught us to do for the people around her, then she was able to do it for larger groups. These groups then formed into small Christian science societies and Christian science churches, and they've spread all over the world. And there are now today Christian science societies and Christian science churches all over the world studying the same Bible lessons and praying the same way to share that news that there is an ever-present help that is presently with us even though the five material senses may seem to be not conscious of it, we do have a spiritual sense which allows us to tune in, if you like, to what the divine message from God to men, speaking to the human consciousness. How does God speak to our human consciousness? Because we've got that law of God that's written in our heart and our minds. We can let that mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. That mystery that's now revealed to the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This was all starting to pan out. Mrs. Eddy felt that what she discovered in 1866 was based on those same unconditional and unchanging laws of God. Those laws of God which had been promised, then they were prophesied, then they were produced in the life and times of Christ Jesus. They seem to have been forgotten to human consciousness for about 1900 years, but then Mrs. Eddy discovers in 1866, those laws of God were still fully present and fully operational, but they were waiting for us to become conscious of them. This became the basis of her teachings in Christian science on how to pray or tune in, if you like, to what the divine message is saying, and the effect of that was healing. These laws, if they are really laws, they must be universal and ever-present, otherwise they're not laws. It's like, where can you go in this town where two plus two makes slightly less than four? Or is there a part of the high school math you know, building where two plus two will make more than four? No, two plus two is an unconditional fixed fact. It doesn't change. It's just four. And these radio waves even, a simple example, but it is useful, I think. These radio waves, they wouldn't care, would they? Whether I'm young or old, rich or poor, male or female. These radio waves, they're just passing through every fiber of my body. Just passing through my body, undetected by my five material senses, and unconditionally there. They're not judging me. They're just passing through me, unconditionally. And what I was starting to learn from these weekly Bible lessons and the testimonies that I was hearing from the church members is that they were experiencing the presence and the power of these unconditional laws, sometimes for the first time. But the result of that was they had a new view of God that completely transformed their well-being. And I always like to finish my lectures with a healing. And this one is one of a younger family member. I'll share it with you to hopefully in some way to show you just how unconditional these laws are. My young brother had fallen off a mountain bike. We had a hill just behind the family home. He'd fallen off a mountain bike and he had just barely made it back to the house with a badly broken arm. I was coming in the front door just after he had come in the back door. He showed me his arm. He said, look, he said, I've fallen off the bike. Get me to the hospital straight away. I said, yes, I'll take you to the hospital. But I also said, would you like me to pray for you in Christian science? If you'd seen his reaction, I may as well have just grown a second head because he kind of backed off and he went, no, look at this. I don't want prayer. I want anesthetic and surgery now. Get me to the hospital. I said, okay, okay, I'll take you. So I drove him to the hospital. Accident and emergency, 
they x-rayed him and they confirmed it was a particularly bad break. In fact, they said because it was so close to the elbow joint, he'd have to spend a few more months than usual in plaster. My brother's heart sank. He said, oh, the finals for my four-year degree are just a couple of weeks' time. The doctor said, you won't be writing with that hand, I'm sorry. So my brother's heart has sunk. Then the doctor delivered a body blow. He looked at his watch and he said, Mr. Hockley, it's now almost 9.30 p.m. on Good Friday. Bank holiday time here in the UK, yes? The fracture clinic staff, they left at 5 and they won't be back in until 8 on Tuesday morning. So I can't put you in a hard plaster tonight. But what I can do is I can strap you very securely to your chest and I'll give you whopping great painkillers. You won't feel a thing. So as the doctor was writing out the prescription for these painkillers, my brother do it, it dawned on my brother that he was now going to be spending four nights sleeping on an unprotected broken arm, knowing full well that he rolled around a lot in his sleep. So his color started to drain when he realized that this could be a terribly painful experience. And he turned to me rather sheepishly and he said, Philip, is prayer still an option? He may as well have said, Philip, are there really radio waves in this room? What do you think I said? Yes, I said, prayer is still an option. It's unconditional. So as we drove home, it's about a 15 minute drive from the hospital back to the family home. I talked to him about those first early lessons that I had learned in Christian science, how Genesis 1 says God made men, women, and children in God's image and likeness. And what I'd learned about the nature of God was that God was, you know, the infinite source of life and truth and love. And then I introduced to him the concept of reflection. And I said, and you know, if God made us in his image and likeness, we must be God's reflection. I said, you understand how a reflection works, don't you? And he said, yes, of course I do, he said. You know, I stand in front of the mirror, my reflection appears. I said, no, no, no. In this concept of Christian science, you have to stand with your back to the mirror because you are God's reflection. We are the image and likeness of God. So I made him back up onto the mirror. And while he was there, he was thinking about this. He started looking down at his arm and glancing in front of himself. And then his countenance started to change. And he said, oh, don't be so ridiculous, he said. God couldn't fall off a mountain bike. And then he said, and don't be so ridiculous, God couldn't have a broken arm like this. I'm off to bed, he said, and off he went. Now, I didn't see him until the following morning at breakfast time, when he marched in proudly announcing, look, he said, all the swelling is gone and I'm in no pain, but I still want to go to that hospital appointment on Tuesday to get this checked. I said, fine, I'll go to the hospital with you. I tidied up the loosened bandages. Tuesday morning came around, we went to the fracture clinic now, and the doctors there rather wisely said, we'll take a fresh image today in case things have changed or moved over the weekend. So they took an x-ray, then the doctor placed it on that light box that they used to look through x-rays, and he pointed to the x-ray and he said, hmm, Mr. Hockley, he said, who told you you have a broken arm? And my brother said, well, on Friday night, accident and emergency did. So the doctor now calls accident and emergency, he gets their image brought around. He now has two images up on his light box. And he says, well, look, he says, on Friday, I can see you had a broken arm. What was the doctor seeing with? One of his five material senses, yes? These five material senses that Mrs. Eddy describes as being false material sense. I was there on Friday. I saw my brother come into the front door of the house with a horrible picture of what looked like a broken arm. But that was so shocking to my material senses, I reverted to my spiritual sense in prayer straight away. And I basically thought to myself, Father, what do you see here? And as clear as a bell, I heard these words. I haven't fallen today, neither has my image and likeness. That case, it was referring to my brother who looked like he'd fallen. So those words comforted me on Friday night. I clung to them like a drowning man at sea. I clung to those words all the way through the hospital experience. So the doctor now is looking on Tuesday and saying, well, on Friday I can see you had a broken arm, but today's x-ray said I can't see one. Can you do some tests for me? Can you stretch out your arm without pain? My brother was able to stretch out his arm with no pain. 
He then said, can you clench your fist back and forth without pain? My brother was able to clench his fist back and forth with no pain. The doctor said, that concludes for me, you don't have a broken arm, you're free to go. We left that hospital rejoicing, oh yes. And my brother sat and passed his finals just a couple of weeks later using that hand. But more importantly, this became a pivotal experience in my brother's life. It changed the man from that day to this. And it all unfolded to him a little bit like this. When he told me what had happened, I knew that he had had a new view of God for himself that had completely transformed his well-being. He said this. He said, when we came out of the hospital, he said, I was terrified about sleeping on that broken arm. He said, I was really, really panicking. And then you told me about those first few lessons you'd learned. God made men, women, and children in God's image and likeness, and God is the infinite spirit of life and truth and love. And he said, it didn't really make any sense to me until you made me back up onto the mirror. And he said, when I backed up onto the mirror and I thought, right, I'm God's reflection here. What is God? He said, when I realized that God couldn't fall off a mountain bike and God couldn't have a broken arm like this, he said, I felt this strange sense of being comforted. And I went off to bed and I slept like a baby, he said. When he said he felt a strange sense of being comforted, I knew he'd had a Bible-based experience because right at the end of Jesus' healing ministry, he said, I'm about to leave you, but I will pray the Father that he will send you another comforter, and this comforter will remain with you through all time. My brother had never picked up a Bible before in his life, yet he experienced a new view of God on that fateful night that completely transformed his well-being. If you had a scale of 1 to 10 on a graph, Bible studies, my brother would be down at zero. And yet, if you go up to the top end of that graph, maybe 9 or 10 out of 10, you'd find people like Mrs. Eddy, who'd studied the Bible almost on a daily basis, and yet Mrs. Eddy has a new view of God in 1866. This completely transformed her well-being. This shows for me that it doesn't matter where you fall on the scale of Bible studies or lack of. These laws are so fully present and so unconditional they're always available for every single one of us when we tune into them, if you like, or become conscious of this constant capacity to understand God. That's what prayer was taught to me in Christian science. You tune into what spiritual sense is saying, which is above what the five material senses are saying, and the result is often healing. This then gave me an incredible view of the practical and unconditional nature of all of these laws of God. They are just as freely available as the principles of math are available, or gravity, or these radio waves, just as unconditionally available, but waiting for us to become conscious of them, yes. And how do we become conscious of them? Prayer as taught in Christian sciences, quieting those five material senses, and just tuning into what your spiritual sense is saying. That spiritual sense which gives you access to a conscious, constant capacity to understand God. God's laws that were written in our hearts and our minds. That mind of Christ, we can let that mind of Christ be in our mind. Why? Because the mystery has been revealed. It's no longer a mystery. It's the Christ in you, the hope of glory. All based on God's promise in First Genesis that every single one of us is made in God's image and likeness. This became such a help in every avenue that I was called to in my private life with my family affairs, my professional life when I started working in Christian Science Nursing, and then later as I'm thinking about the world and the stage of world events that we've gone through in recent years, some unprecedented challenges and even these challenges, I found some incredible comfort from a passage that Mrs. Eddy had written over 150 years ago, which speak brilliantly to these present times. It's on page 340 of Science and Health. Mrs. Eddy wrote this. 
One infinite God, good, unifies men and nations, constitutes the brotherhood of man, ends wars, fulfills the scripture, love thy neighbor as thyself, annihilates pagan and Christian idolatry. Whatever is wrong in social, civil, criminal, political, and religious codes, equalizes the sexes, annuls the curse on man, and leaves nothing that can sin, suffer, be punished, or destroyed. These words have not just comforted me as I face these dreadful challenges over the last few years and the prospect of some kind of peace arising in Ukraine at the moment, but countless hundreds of thousands of Christian scientists are praying with the same ideas. And we would like to offer the same option for you as well. If this is the first time you've joined a Christian Science lecture and you'd like a copy of the Christian Science textbook, Science and Health, the contact details at the end will allow you to reach out and we'll get a copy to you. If you've never heard of Christian Science before, it makes no difference. I had never heard of the principle of radio waves until my physics teacher demonstrated them to me. But those radio waves were still fully present for me still fully unconditionally available. The same applies to each and every one of us. And if any of these ideas have appealed to you, please don't just take my word for it. Try this for yourself. Try quietening your five material senses and tune in, if you like, with your spiritual sense and see if you can hear that true idea, voicing good, the divine message from God to men, speaking to your human consciousness. You can't overdose on this stuff. It's freely available, just waiting for us to become conscious of it. And you know, where I come from, if something is really good and you want to recommend it to your friends, you'd say to them, oh, go fill your boots with that, right? And for us, what fill your boots means is if it's a nice cake that your auntie has baked or something, you'd say, take a slice of cake, but then take a couple of slices for later, right? Fill your boots, have some more. If any of these ideas appeal to you, please fill your boots with them. Have as much of them as you like. Try them for yourself. These are ever-present helps. Waiting for us to become conscious of them, yes. But hopefully the ideas we've shared in the lecture today will give you some tools to practice that for yourself. The church that have sponsored this lecture today, the Christian Science Society here in Carlisle, the technical team working their magic in the background to make this appear in far distant places, and myself, we've all been cherishing this event for months, just praying that it will be of some use to you. And if you find yourself in dreadful, fearful circumstances, or if you've even been told you're incurable, hopefully this can offer you some comfort to overcome those fears. And if you've been told you're incurable, this Christian science might be able to offer you a cure. Please, try it for yourself. Fill your boots and be blessed in everything you do. Thank you so much.